Um, I'm going to run through a, a little bit of an agenda. Um, we'll cover some, some things which we're, we're going to talk about in, in shortly. Um, I'm the director and founder of uh, Securius. Um, we've been going operation about 11 years now. We've employed about five or so um, graduates and um, people from Plymouth University. So um, if you'd like to come and see us in the break, and that, we're, we're more than happy to, uh, to have some conversations around uh, developing some of you guys as well. So um, that's my pitch over with. Um, amongst other things, in my, in my day job, I'm a, a PCI QSA, which is a, a payment card industry qualified security assessor. Bit of a mouthful. Um, so I'm qualified to, to assess companies uh, around PCI compliance and how they take card data and protect that card data and become compliant with the industry standards. So it's been quite a, an interesting role over the last 12 months or so we've been um, operating. Um, and we're gonna share, so I'm gonna share some experiences, uh, some of the things I've found uh, working with clients this year. We, we actually work with quite a few clients in um, making them compliant and, and developing their, their PCI um, environment. But unfortunately, we do end up with, um, the, with the clients who have had breaches, and we, we call in uh, post-forensic examination to, to actually carry out assessments. And some of the, uh, the three examples I'm going to show you today are, are live clients, but we've, uh, we've masked their, their actual names and uh, job function just to protect their identities. So I'm going to cover a couple of things in the news. Uh, I'm sure you would be aware of some of the, the bigger items in the news. Um, I'll cover a couple of those items. Also looking then into some of the more local news and some of the, the recent breaches we've been working with and um, some of the lo more local sort of brings it home to a local environment really. Um, some of the post-breach post actions enforced by the, the card brands uh, on these organisations and how they must maintain their compliance going forward. A couple of items around PCI data security standard misconceptions. There, there are a few out there, trust me. Um, and if time permits, then we'll, we'll open up some questions for Bob. Okay. So, there's quite a few credit cards in circulation. This is, these are UK stats only, so you can imagine the, the global population of uh, credit cards. So, if I have a quick show of hands in the room, how many people have a credit card right now? Yeah, that's pretty cool based on this uh, population here. That's, that's still about 60%, so that's cool. Took me a lot longer to count 32 million, obviously, but, um, but it's around 60%. So annual number of um, card data um, transactions at the moment is, is greater than 15 billion transactions. That's, per, that's a transaction. Uh, the actual value of that transaction is... Uh, looking at greater than £650 billion pounds worth of transactions on credit cards. These are UK stats only. And um, it, it dawned on me the other day when I was just running through these slides, this particular slide is probably one to, to make a point, is um, that's probably not the safest way to carry your credit cards. So let's have a, let's have a quick look at the news, uh, news items. Um, a couple I want to concentrate on. Um, British Airways breach, anyone heard of that? Can I take this mic out? Is, is that better? I can move around a bit now and um, talk a bit, bit more freely. Everyone hear me okay? Is that cool? Okay. Um, I, I'm not going to do some disco dance now. I just want to free myself up a little bit. Um, so British Airways, they had a, a breach earlier on um, this year. At the moment, the, we're still waiting on the fallout from the final details of, of how it happened and, and some of the the procedures that, that were in place or not in place, and, and we'll, we'll get full reports on that as, as time goes on. But today we know that 380,000 um, details were exposed. Um, we know that credit card data was involved in those exposures, potentially people booking holidays, paying for their, their holidays online with their credit cards. And also what was really interesting about the report was the, um, the fact that the, the whole PAN data, the, the full 16-digit credit card details, and the CVV code, which is your three-pin digit, uh, three-digit security number on the back of the card, was captured. Now, it's absolutely there's no way you're allowed to store CVV codes after transactions. So, it's all it all looks likely that this was a, a um, an in-flight transaction breach. And excuse the pun there; it wasn't intended. So. It's, 
the data, the, as the transactions process, a live pro process there, it looks like the data was uh, stolen at that point. So it'd be quite interesting to see what, what comes out of this, this report and an analysis on it. Ticketmaster, again, uh, another major breach. Um, now, Ticketmaster, as along with quite a few larger websites, and certainly websites that are uh, geared towards public sales, etc., they use a lot of um, JavaScript libraries. And JavaScript libraries are compilations of um, JavaScript code that are embedded into websites, and they can pull out things like um, user interactions, demographics of users that are using the website, and it's all geared around delivering a better product and a more targeted product for, for end customers. Um, Ticketmaster used um, Inventor, which is a, a chatbot uh, customer, so customer support service um, module that they embedded into all of their web pages, and those web pages obviously included the, the payment page. It's likely that the, um, one of the JavaScript libraries was compromised, including a, um, a keylogger, and, and the bad guys uh, left with a whole heap of um, credit card data from, from that breach. Tesco's breach. So this was quite an interesting one, um, and it sort of highlights um, so some of the issues around regulatory compliance. So Tesco's breach, they've had a breach. There's some card data involved with that. They've already paid two and a half million pounds in compensation to some of their customers around um, claims that have already been put forward to Tesco's. The Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, has already fined them as well, 16.4 million pounds uh, for bringing a fraud case to them in terms of uh, exposing their customers to, or potentially exposing their customers to, to fraud issues and um, compromise uh, elsewhere. So th there's, a, there's obviously the, the second sort of fine there. Uh, the PCI Council, or the, the card brands, haven't actually got around to um, coming up with a fine for them at the moment. The Information Commission Office, uh, the ICO, could find them up to half a million pounds because it's pre, um, what's that, GD, GD, GDPR, was it? Something like that. Pre GDPR. Um, and potentially, if it was post GDPR, obviously you're looking at the greater of 20 million euros or 4% of annual global turnover. Um, potential fine there could be 1.9 um, billion pounds. So there's some really big um, issues going on here. But the highlight here, really, the takeaway is that. Um, you know, multiple industry bodies can find you. Um, you're not just going to get hit with one fine for a breach, potentially. What was another interesting note about um, Tesco's bank? They issued um, debit cards with sequential numbers, which is really bad practice in the in the financial world. You never you never send out cards with the very next digit or sequential number, and it's it's quite bad practice. So, not many lenders do that. So, uh, quite a large amount of credit card fraud is, um, is, is carried out v via um, uh, card, ho card holder not present um, transactions. And what I mean by that, it's all the, um, the payments you make online through websites, purchasing, telephone payments, um, if you're phoning it to pay for an event or something like that. And obviously the, the old post uh, and the mail uh, forms where you, you, you get a an order form, a paper order form, and you put your credit card details on, post it off, and away you go. I don't think anybody does that anymore, but I might be wrong. Um, and credit card fraud is, you know, there's a good, is way over 70% now, um, which is re remote purchase fraud, and it's exactly what the, um, the threat actors are stealing credit card data for now. They'll, they'll pull it all together, ship it out, and you'll, you'll buy a batch of credit, stolen credit card details and just start buying stuff. Um, and using it in this way. So it can be quite a big, uh, well, for large organizations, this sort of issue is quite, quite a, a big problem. Um, if you imagine uh, a multinational chain, for example, trying to implement the smallest of chains throughout their organization, uh, it, it can be quite, proved to be quite a, a headache. I remember working with a, a large organization a few years ago, and we had a, a regular weekly change management meeting. And there was 54 people in that group, and we could never make any decision. It was, it was absolutely bizarre. Um, so, you know, a large organization is going to find a, a real struggle sometimes to, to implement some of these um, changes and processes, really. For a smaller company, it just becomes a bigger problem. 
Um, smaller organizations generally don't necessarily have that, that skill set in-house to, to implement um, credit card security if they're a merchant taking payments, etc. Um, and also, they don't necessarily understand the implications of, uh, of a card breach. And we have to be clear here that a card breach will cost some money um, in terms of fines and, and potentially leave them unable um, to trade anymore. So it can be quite a, a, bi a, quite a bigger problem. So I'm going to move on to some uh, a quick um, analogy, really, of uh, one particular strain of malware um, that we've seen. It's been around for years. Um, it really has. Um, but it's just slowly, well, over the last two, three months, it's actually gone for the roof. And um, we don't know why, but there there's seems to be really, really active at the moment. Um, it's called uh, Magic Heart. You may have heard it. You may have heard of this anyway. Um, I'll show you quickly, really briefly, how it works. So, the attacker injects malicious script into the target website, and again, this can be direct into the website, or it can be via um, JavaScript libraries, compromise, etc. But it'll get the um, the malicious script within this website. Normally, only on the payment page, but it can be wider than that. The the user then would load the web page select items uh, to purchase, collect all those into a shopping basket, for example, and then process that by click pay here, etc. That transaction or that, that data then gets pushed back to the merchant website um, via the form or uh, the page it's on. But also a copy of that data then gets gleaned off to the, the threat actors for, for collection. So it's a real simple simple um, breach, um, and it does bypass quite a lot of the, um, the security elements um, on a website that, that people may have, ha may have in place already. So I say local news, it's, it sort of brings it home, really. We've, um, we've been QSA company now for five years, three, four or five years, um, and we see lots and lots of organizations and various levels of PCI compliance and, and requirements and and you know it, it's quite a broad broad uh, broad scale really we, we see um, service providers little merchants the, the whole whole breadth of it really so I'm going to run through um, three examples and just you know we've had a real good insight into some of the problems they've, they've had and it's given us a real insight into some of the issues they've been having and um, potentially some of the ways they could have cured or moved forward with the, these things. Example one then. So this is a, an online furniture store. I've titled it Poor Website Administration. So they're running an old version uh, website management application. So if it, most of you may, may know that obviously if you're managing a website, you'll, you'll have some sort of login or some administration page, a Plesk or something like this or Magento, you'll, you'll have a, generally speaking, you'll have an admin page, and it was running some really old um, version of that. Had malicious code embedded onto the web server. Um, they had no monitor in place, and they had shared um, admin account access to the website. Now, just around that one, the, the shared admin account, so they had, um, they were all, there was four or five developers uh, managing the website, they were all using one shared admin account. So Fred, the ad admin, was making one change one day. Bill, the admin, next day was making another change. Sarah took some pages down under the admin um, account. So the complete lo lack of control there um, on who's actually administering the, um, the website. The acquiring bank um, informed the, the, the company that they'd had a breach. and. The way they do that, they, they go off and do um, card transaction analysis. So they, they may investigate customers complaining that um, transactions aren't legitimate. So they'll investigate that. They'll look at the card number that was the transaction. They'll look at the transaction um, payment reference number. And they can trace that payment history back down to the merchant ID. So the merchant ID will be the company's um, merchant account ID, basically, to, to trade. So. If you want money from credit card purchases into your bank account, you'll have to set up a, a merchant ID, uh, a merchant account. And that's, that's how basically it's traced back to the, the website in question. So between, we don't know for sure, but between 100 and 200 account data are stolen. 
Um, interestingly as well, they, they had old um, test accounts on the website with re really weak passwords, so it wasn't really um, managed that, that well at all. And, and the other thing was, well, the, the other killer thing really was the um, website administration was accessible anywhere on the internet, so they hadn't locked it down to specific host IP addresses or they haven't even thought about security. You could literally fire at the admin page wherever you were in the world. <coughs> so they, they had um, a fair bit of cost to deal with on that one. Example two, this is around third party due diligence. So this is an on-site on uh, retail shop selling high value goods. Lack of access control. Full admin, full admin access given to the marketing company. So these guys employed a third party marketing organization to literally run their marketing campaigns, their SEO campaigns, and all the, all the good marketing things around, around the website. What happened here, um, they, didn't have, well, they didn't have a great relationship with their marketing company, I must admit. Um, and they, they were constantly falling out. And what actually happened, um, it got to a point, I think, where the clients in question were really frustrated with the questions that kept coming back from the marketing company. We can't do X, Y, Z. We need access to do this. I think they, it came to a break point where they just said, well, there you go. There's full admin access to the website. Do what you like. You're the marketeers. You, you, can, you crack on and get on with the marketing and, and get our business promoted. And they did. Unfortunately, the marketing company had a breach. Um, and one of their JavaScript libraries uh, w was compromised. That then populated into this client's website, and they had over 200 credit card data stolen. Um, the client was totally unaware of the breach, uh, and um, there's really little, and, and by the time we were called in, there's little or no communication with the marketing company. They, they'd really obviously fallen out with them in big time. Um, but there really is very little um, due diligence carried out on the, on the marketing company before they actually engaged with them. Um, and no, obviously, I mentioned full ac admin access, so there's no real control over um, the administration accounts within the marketing company. And we think there was probably, as new, uh, new employees started with a marketing company, they were just given the same account. So there's loads and loads of admin accounts within that uh, third party. Um, and I think they're still in a legal wrangle now on who's actually uh, liable for that, that cost. My final example um, is an online clothing store. Um, inexperienced developers. So we all know, you think of a great idea, you, you, you can buy a, a website, you can populate it with a load of stuff, and you can get online within, within minutes really nowadays and, um, and forget about it. As long as it's generating revenue, fantastic. You know. Brilliant, but when you get to a size where you actually start have to have to employ developers, and um, developers then take on the day-to-day -day management of your of your website. So the the, the problem with this company, they they'd had um, they, they chose to use um, inexperienced developers, so they only knew what they knew, and it wasn't really um, they'd never worked in an e-commerce environment. So the real basic thing, an unpatched server was in place. Um, there's a really clever tool that the uh, threat actors had actually embedded onto this website. So slightly different to uh, Megacart, but it was a, a screenshot grabbing um, piece of software. So when people entered their card data, it would take a screenshot and save as a JPEG image on the website. So the bad guys are coming back every two or three days and just downloading the JPEG files. And hey, presto, there's all your credit card going. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, there's no website code change man, uh, control in place, so there, there are random code changes and, and updates and um, interesting things going on without any, any sort of knowledge within the team of developers as to what, what's actually happening with the website. Um, no alerting or monitoring in place. That, that was a key one as well. They, they never knew any of this was happening, uh, going on in the background. I'm, I'm trying, to, trying not to, to smile too much, but there's a smirk in me here that which I'll tell you about, the, um, the, the actual the resolution of this problem is literally an inexperienced developer that overwrote the website accidentally that killed off all the malicious code. So they actually fixed the problem um, without realizing it, but they still, had, um, they still went through the, uh, the process of uh, forensic examination 
Um, and that one cost them quite dearly on, on that site. So it was quite, quite an interesting case to be on that one. So moving on to the post-breach action. So by signing up for a merchant account and a, as a, a trader, an online trader, um, specifically, on, specifically online trading, because that's what we're talking about today, but it's any, any sort of merchant um, account, you'll be issued with a, a merchant account details. You'll have to submit compliance every year to PCI Council, uh, to, to, to the, sorry, the um, acquiring bank, show you're compliant. <clears throat> and part of the, the small print um, are some mandatory um, items that you sign up for. And, and quite a few companies that get hit with fines and uh, mandatory forensic examinations don't actually realize until the point of breach that they actually have signed up for this. So the first action, once you've been notified of uh, a card breach, is you'll, you'll have to um, have a PCI forensic examination. There's um, a qualified bunch of people that come in and basically do um, a forensic examination on behalf of the PCI Council. They'll check, uh, obviously, all, all items around how card transactions work, et cetera. People like Barclay Card, um, WorldPay, some of the bigger players, they, they have a sliding scale with this as well. So um, because it can cost 25 to 100 grand for a forensic examination, depending on the environment, and I say depending on the envir environment, if you're taking up to 20,000 card transactions per annum, you're a very low risk to the bank, and you'll get a sliding scale, maybe it'll, you'll know that it'll only cost you 5,000 pounds, for example, for a forensic examination. Still a lot of money to, to take a hit on if you're a small organization, um, but obviously that, that, if you're a supermarket taking 25, 30 million transactions a week, then the whole, it's a whole different ball game. Um, so you'll have your PCI forensic examination, They'll highlight um, the problem, that find out what actually happened with the, uh, with the breach, and recommend some, uh, some fixes for you to, to implement before you come on to the level one PCI assessment. Level one assessment is a, an on-site um, assessment conducted by PCI QSA, um, and that's a full-on checking for you know, over 300 uh, controls are in place, and making sure that there's no um, mishandling of uh, credit card data and it's all nice and secure. Now, what normally happens, and f f purely through experience, um, what happens sometimes the, the, your acquiring bank will say, um, we've, we've reported a car breach, you are now, your company now is at risk, it'll get flagged as a, uh, as a marker at, at risk, you'll now be non-compliant, so again, another, another flag on your account. The acquiring bank then will say, or, um, will let, will say, you need to be PCI compliant, for example, in three months' time, we need a report on compliance and proof that you are PCI compliant before we can move forward. Sometimes they say, and, and if you're not, we'll find you another $50,000 or whatever, depending on the merchant, et cetera, and the, um, the car brand requirements. And again, the environment you're in. So we, gen we generally work with um, companies uh, of all ilks um, we, and quite often we get a uh, you know we get engaged with clients we need a PCI QSA assessment and we need it in two weeks time what's happened there is they've been given a deadline of three months and then two and three quarter months they think crikey we need to get a P PCI QSA in to do this so we're, we're really up against it sometimes and um, our relationship then moves from not only the client but we then have to start talking to the card brands the acquirers and start pushing back on deadlines and timings and things just to prevent further fines um, we can do this via a prioritize approach so we can evidence that we are engaged with the client and we are working towards the six key goals to get uh, get them up and compliant as soon as possible then we would submit the report on compliance and the attestation of compliance to the, uh, to the acquiring bank. Um, the next year then, the, the client would probably go back down to the self-assessment level if it was at that level before, and normal services would resume. But we have to be um, quite clear that the PCI forensic examination might find that um, the method of um, taking credit card data was really, really poor. It might have been a, a post form and it's a really weak 
way of um, taking card data. They might recommend you, sometimes they even recommend switching acquiring banks to, to get a better, um, um, an embedded, I fr embedded frame, for instance, an iframe within your website, or you may have to redesign the whole payment process and have a full redirect to a third party payment service provider. So there's, there can be quite a lot of change involved um, post breach as well. So the, the clients don't really estimate, uh, they, they definitely underestimate the, the cost and effort to do that as well. <clears throat> but it's not all bad. There is blue sky and sunshine around the corner. Um, from our experience, again, some of the, the things that um, we, we've seen in, um, that haven't happened, but it's really um, good, good things, and we've sort of built action lists on, on what companies can do uh, to help prevent some of these uh, problems. So user access controls, you know, least privileges for the, for the job in hand. So if, if you're outsourcing your, outsourcing your marketing um, branding, etc., to a third party. Do they need full admin rights to your website and give them just only permissions to, to carry out their, their, their specific tasks? Patching and software updates. This is a good one. Um, I think every time I switch on a Windows machine, it's 35% ready downloading patches. And I think Patch Tuesday should be cancelled and Patch Every Day should be the, the new word. But I know it's really frustrating and I know. Um, it can be quite, quite tricky to, to run a whole patching regime within a, a larger organization. Um, but it is um, fixing some of the known vulnerabilities. And uh, um, with the exception of, the, I think, the latest Windows 10 update, we'll, we'll ignore that one. But mostly, it fixes the uh, vulnerabilities and um, doesn't cause any or too many problems. But, but more importantly, it's, it's, it's just basically getting hold of the, um, any security patches and any high-level critical patches need to be um, updated at least. Change management process. Um, again, this, this was a, a key, uh, key finding, a key takeaway really for the companies. Um, implementing a, a good, solid change management process that isn't incorporating 50 or 60 people into a weekly meeting. It's incorporating the key players and the key um, business units that operate uh, within the, the, the card environment and, and understanding um, and getting um, authorized um, change processes in place. So no one person is actually implementing a change. It's actually um, verified, it's authorized, signed off, and then there's a, a plan for for rolling any changes out. And also having that uh, backup as well and having a rollback plan in place if it all goes horribly wrong. Um, third party supplier insurance. Make sure there's a, a robust due diligence process in place. And that could look like, are they, uh, are they compliant themselves? What sort of markets are they dealing with? Um, if you're a, a ticketing, ticketing agent um, and you've got a third party marketer, but they only work in, I don't know, bespoke, um, bespoke hotels or something, you know, is it the right mix for, for what you want to do? Um, you know, do, do some proper um, due diligence on these third parties that may interact with your, your website. Um, critical system monitoring now, I think it's probably fair to say that most hosting providers now offer some level of monitoring and alerting. I think um, not only in the capacity way, but looking at your servers and, and um, capacity within, within those, but also some of the um, um, DDoS protection uh, and also some intrusion detection type software that which, which would alert you via email or whatever. Um, to, to some sort of um, known attack on your website. But even the most simplest form of um, website monitoring, if you, if you baseline it um, and you, you've got, say, for example, two meg of traffic going onto your website per day and then it all of a sudden goes up to 100 meg and you've got masses of data outbound from your website, you know, well, what's actually going on with your website? You know, we need to at least do the base, baseline monitoring. And, and um, if you don't know what normal looks like, then you'll never know what unusual looks like. So that's really key to some of these um, things we've seen. So a couple of uh, PCI compliance misconceptions. Um, and we hear, we, we hear them all, um, almost to the point of, we'll leave you locked in this room with a suitcase. If you choose to open the suitcase and take the 50,000 pounds, then all good. However, you know, we're not quite at that level yet, but um, and I'm not suggesting we do that, obviously. Um, but some of the PCI uh, misconceptions, only necessary for large organizations. Well, that, that's 
rubbish. Obviously, um, no matter how how big or small you are, if you're taking cardholder uh, credit card details, then you need to be PCI compliant. And there's a massive sliding scale of what level of compliance uh, within the PCI compliance um, you, you need to be. And it's it's all there on the PCI website as well. So you've got no excuses for for, for not being compliant. Um, so you don't have to worry about PCR compliance if you outsource your credit card processing. So a lot of companies now um, are reliant on, and, and, and I must say that the best way to be PCR compliant is don't handle card data at all. That's the easiest way to do it. Descope as much as you can. So just let it be handled by a compliant third-party payment service provider. That's the easiest thing to do. Um, however, two of those examples earlier used third-party payment services provider based on the fact that they were selling the silver bullet, use our service, we'll, we'll even uh, pre-populate your self-assessment questionnaire and submit it to your acquiring bank so you're compliant. Fantastic, we'll go for that. However, if you've still got a poorly managed website, it doesn't matter who you're using, you've still got that, that breach uh, vulnerability. And like I say, two of those examples, one was using Magento, one was using Stripe. So it's, it's quite important to not only have that rounded sort of um, environment there. So even if you do outsource your credit card processing, you as a company and organization, you still have to be PCI compliant. So whether that's um, the lowest level, a SAC A, for example, a self-assessment questionnaire, where you do, you just have to fill out, I think there's 12 requirements. So it's quite easy to do, um, but you still have to maintain your own compliance. And even part of your own compliance is making sure that the, per, the payment service provider is compliant. That's, that's the ver very minimum. Um, it's only for business to store credit card information. So credit card information can be stored so long as it's masked or tokenized or encrypted. Um, most, um, you know, most banks obviously need to see the full pan. They need to see the, the, the CVV number. They need, to, they need full access to that, that card, obviously. But they would go through some really strict and stringent um, security um, processes there. If you're, a, if you're an online retailer, you don't need to see the card data. You don't need to store it. You can just literally have a payment transaction reference number. You, there's many companies now are using tokenization where they just get a token back from that payment. It's a unique token based around that, that transaction, um, the, the value, et cetera. So you're just really keeping ledgers of what's being transactioned for your, your website. Um, and, but again, it's not... Um, it's, it's all about storing, processing, or transmitting card data. So if you're only one part of that ecosystem from point A to point B, um, you might only be hosting an environment, but you still have to be PCI compliant because the, the security of that credit card data, while it's in your hands, could be put at risk potentially. So it's just a whole um, ecosystem there. PCI data security standard is open to interpretation, apparently. Um, it's, it's a very, very black and white, very prescriptive um, um, compliance model. It's, it's not like a, um, an ISO 27001, for example, all about information security management system. It's the, the first question normally on those engagements is, what's my scope, followed by what do you want it to be? <laughs> it can be this office, it can be the whole business, it can be multiple sites. PCI compliance is all around protecting card data and there's some very clear guidelines and steps and, and processes in place that, that need to be there really to protect that, um, to protect your, your PCI card data environment. Um, there's no sort of halfway house with this. It's you've either got it in place or you haven't or you've mitigated the risk by outsourcing it to a compliant third party. It's as simple as that. If only it was that simple.